Welcome to the 16th lecture on aqueous corrosion and its uh, control. Now, we are discussing on the galvanic corrosion part 3, right. We are looking at the galvanic corrosion correct. Now, after looking at the electrochemical parameters that govern the galvanic corrosion, we need to look at overall factors which can influence the galvanic corrosion of dissimilar metals, ok. So, I term it as factors affecting galvanic corrosion. The more obvious one is the nature of the environment. The second is location of galvanic attack. The third we are using two different metals, two different structures having different chemistry, different electrochemical parameters and the area ratios are very relevant, very important ok. Area ratios of anode and cathode. So, we shall uh, go in details and try to understand. If you understand the factors controlling galvanic corrosion, it will be much easier for you to devise means of controlling the galvanic corrosion. So, that is the whole basic idea of, of um, analyzing the factors, those can influence the galvanic corrosion. Let us start with the the nature of the environment. We can say the severity of the environment would increases the galvanic corrosion also increases. The vice versa is also true. If the environment is quite mild, then the galvanic attack becomes relatively slower, ok. Now, uh, we can have just few illustrations to demonstrate how the severity of the environment is going to be influencing. I give you two examples. One is uh, the corrosion in magnesium sulphate, which is relatively a mild environment and corrosion in sodium chloride solution, which is relatively a severe environment, ok. And take the two uh, metals, which are steel and the zinc. If you can look at the corrosion rate of these two metals in uncoupled conditions and galvanical coupled conditions, you will see how the corrosion of the zinc which is more active would change significantly if the environment becomes very severe. This is a data taken from the Fontana book, you can just have uh, you know feel for it. Let's take the case of uh, 0.05 molar magnesium sulphate. zinc which really does not dissolve and corrode, steel corrodes. When you galvanically couple these two, you notice that zinc corrodes at a higher rate and steel in fact shows a marginal improvement in the weight, in fact the weight gain 
But you notice that the weight gain is not because of growth of steel, growth of iron. It primarily happens because when you make a, a metal cathode, you know, the pH goes up and some deposition occurs. So, if you clean them up, you would not see there is any significant improvement, increase in the corrosion rate. So, this, this rise in the weight is not anywhere related to the metal deposition here. As opposed to this, you take uh, molar NaCl solution, both the steel and um, zinc corrode. See, both corrode, in fact, the corrosion rate is almost the same, uh, primarily because it may be diffusion controlled, right. The diffusion control, it does not depend upon the corrosion tendency of a metal, right. In the couple conditions, you see that zinc corrodes at much higher rate and um, steel, it does not corrode at all. So, the corrosion rate of, uh, of the active metal here, I mean the relatively active metal here, the zinc is very much dependent upon the how severe the environment is and the environment here sodium chloride proves to be very aggressive in HS. There are also cases where the galvanic tendency of the metal changes. If you change the temperature or concentration, it is possible that at, at, at a given temperature and pressure or a concentration one metal act as active, other one act as a noble. Slightly change the temperature, the metal which is active turns into a noble metal. These things are having practical relevance importance. We give some examples. Let us take the case of steel versus the zinc here. And uh, all of us know that galvanized steels and the zinc coated zinc, uh, you know, uh, it sacrifices and then steel is getting uh, protected, right. But if the temperature of the coating is increased, if the temperature goes beyond 80 degree Celsius, zinc becomes noble and iron becomes iron as steel becomes active. And this is called as galvanic reversal. Such a phenomena has uh, practical problems. One is we have seen that um, you know the the galvanic corrosion of, of steel. You know, if, if the steel is a uh, galvanized steels. What does it mean? Here, steel corrodes. One more example uh, which is uh, relevant, we will discuss a little later actually, is application of zinc as sacrificial anodes. The in a in a cooling water system. Not possible. B 
beyond 80 degrees. Why? The zinc starts passivating, it loses its uh, protective nature. In which case you may have to use magnesium or anyway zinc is not going to work. There are few more examples which is import in fact very interesting. You take uh, tantalum and platinum. This is, is a passive system. This is let us say sulfuric acid right and you do not see no galvanic no galvanic current. Okay, until 110 degrees Celsius. Temperature of the sulfuric acid, you have no problem. You can have platinum and uh, tantalum coupled together, you do not give any galvanic corrosion rate at all. But if you rise it above or equal to 265 degrees Celsius, okay, and tantalum corrodes and you will see a galvanic current of about 100 milliampers square feet. The tantalum turns into a active metal. The galvanic corrosion was not operating at all. Yes, one more practical example is you know the tin coated steel containers for storing the food right it is a beverage cans ok. If the uh, the food I mean if some of let us say juice for example orange, uh, orange juice or apple juice it decomposes and give rise to organic acid it attacks tin tin complexes, the tin becomes uh, active. Otherwise, tin is a noble metal right compared to steel ok. So, that is not going to work. Now, steel I mean your tin starts corroding because of the complexing of this actually ok. So, such kind of galvanic reversals are, uh, are of importance in industries and should be taken care of or should be studied very well before uh, you select the system. Let us look at the location of the galvanic attack. Take an example, yeah. In which case? See, see uh, oh, in the case of tin you are uh, in the case of zinc you are talking about? Ah, yeah. See, you take in the case of zinc. Okay. When you raise the temperature, the zinc forms a nice adherent zinc hydroxide, zinc carbonate, which are somewhat similar to passivation. And you know that when the metal is passivation, the corrosion potential moves up, the corrosion rate drops. Whereas, in high temperature, steel does not get protected, it does not form a protective oxide film. Okay. So, the corrosion potential of zinc becomes higher compared to the corrosion potential of steel because steel does not form any passive films. Please understand the galvanic corrosion depends primarily on E car, it does not depend on corrosion rate at all. The first and foremost condition is the potential difference, the travel slope exchange current density all of them are important, but if the potential difference between these two metals do not exist, then there will be no galvanic corrosion or the one which exhibits a relatively uh, active uh, 
corrosion potential will act as a as an anode ok. So, the potential will what happens? So, surface changes would, would, would bring in this this kind of effect. Tantalum is a similar situation rise the temperature sulfuric acid the passivation is no more stable it just goes away. Uh, tantalum is one of the reactive material right. How does the corrosion resistance for tantalum affected? Somewhat similar to stainless steel or titanium alloys. In fact, better than titanium alloys, the oxide film is very stable ok. And that is why tantalum is used in most aggressive environment although it is very expensive. But oxide films are kinetic resistance right. If you rise the temperature, the film breaks, the film dissolves and so the galvanic reversal occurs in this case right ok. Yeah, thank you for the question. Mm. Let us look at the location of the galvanic attack. It is it is a very uh, important relevance for us actually ok. Let us take an example of let us say a copper you have a steel and it is exposed to the environment and you know that this is the anode right. and electrons move like this and there is going to be maybe H plus or oxygen whatever it comes and hydrogen is getting liberated. Agreed? This is what happens. Now, you tell me where will the galvanic attack be severe? in this case, the most severe yeah at the interface right. The galvanic corrosion will be more severe at the interface. Why it is more severe at the interface? The answer is correct, but why, why is it more severe you consider? The potential difference between this point and this point remain the same that is going to be almost independent of that ok. What more is coming to picture here is the resistance offered by the electrolyte right. The resistance offered by the electrolyte. So, the current flows like this what electrons flow this way and current flows in the electrolyte. So, if the current has to flow from this end to the other end, foremost end, the resistance increases, the, the quantum of current that reaches this place will be less compared to the quantum of current that reaches to the interface because the resistance it depends on what? Resistance depends upon the rho L upon A gives you the resistance. The resistivity of the electrolyte, the length over which the current is going to flow, of course, the area which the current is going to flow, cross section over which the current is going to flow related to resistance. So, as this the, 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 the distance increases, the quantum of current that is going to flow reduced. So, the amount of current corrosion is going to be decreasing from this point to this point. So, that means if the resistivity of the electrolyte is increasing, what is going to happen? Assume that there are two electrolytes, one with a higher resistivity, the other with the lower resistivity and you will see the attack and what kind of attack difference you will find. The same copper and steel, one with a higher resistivity other one with lower resistivity. What kind of differences do you see by just observing them? That is true, but between the two. The when the resistance is higher in the electrolyte, the activity is higher. Yeah. So, when the resistivity is more, the localized attack is more and the attack is confined to the interface right more then the attack 
அது இன்டர்ஃபேஸ் ஃபேஸ் பிகம்ஸ் ஹை in fact uh, this is one of the characteristics of galvanic corrosion okay if you want to diagnose a problem if you see in the industry that there are two different you know set of metals which are electrically shorted and you want to show that there is a galvanic corrosion the first criteria is that what the interface should have a deeper attack in fact attack will be something like that this is your active metal your relatively noble metal right on the on the other hand assume that i have pipeline and pipeline i got you know the two different metals in the pipeline okay and i have a pipe so one side is relatively active other side is relatively noble the fluid is going inside and it's corroding if the corrosion is away from the interface and see here would you call it as a galvanic corrosion and it happened in the active metal right would you call it as a, would you call it as a galvanic corrosion do you get my question the pipeline carrying of corrosive fluid the pipeline has got you know two parts part 1 is active metal part 2 is uh, noble metal and they are electrically shorted as interface the pipeline leaks you found that the leak has occurred at the anodic member of pipeline but you also notice that the leak is not at the interface it is about about say about but 10 cm away from that okay or 5 cm away from this would you call that as a galvanic corrosion you have to give an answer huh? why do you call it galvanic corrosion then yeah if the resistance is offered then you should be confined more to us when you say resistance means what higher resistance then you should be more confined to the interface huh if there is a resistance but still the corrosion is occurring hmm so the liquid is moving yeah liquid is moving that's what the problem we get in industry right so what do you think if the corrosion has to occur by galvanic mechanism there's no other way but the interface has to corrode at higher rate is there any other way you can do that when the resistance of the of the of the electrolyte is uh, you know uh, of the electrolyte increases from the cathode to the anode as you move away from it the current will not flow more the expected current to flow more at i i i distance and less current at the interface the physics does not permit it has corroded no doubt but it is not due to galvanic corrosion at all it cannot happen you need to diagnose what the problem is there may be other form of corrosion that has happened but yes certainly it is not a galvanic corrosion so it is very important that we need to know the fingerprints you need to know the 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 the, um, the characteristics of the corrosion failure the characteristics of corrosion failure is it happens with the active metal it happens more at the interface if it happens for example at the noble metal you would not call a galvanic corrosion maybe something maybe erosion has taken place metal may be noble but is softer it happen maybe there are some microbial corrosion taking place so it is very important that you need to understand the fundamental and then try to relate 
to the failure. It cannot be having a conflict with the basics. Okay. Okay. So, it is not really a galvanic corrosion in which case it may be different then you need to diagnose and find out the root cause why the corrosion has taken place there. Uh, this is in fact is a fingerprint of galvanic corrosion. The environment is, is less severe, the guru attack becomes less only, but you cannot say that corrosion occurs far away and so there is uh, it is a galvanic corrosion. Let us go into the next important aspect of it, the area effect. It is very easy to understand and it is a very impacting in designing structures to avoid galvanic corrosion. Let us look at the mixed production theory and see whether it helps us. You know that total cathodic current is equal to the total anodic current, right. It cannot really change. Now, what is this is equal to what? This is equal to current density multiplied by the area of the cathode it is equal to right current density at the anode and area of the anode. Agreed? Okay. You know what it is, right? A represents what? A represents area. Okay. And other uh, variables that you are aware of, right? Let us rearrange this equation. Equation 1, equation 2. See. What do you understand from this equation? Yeah. If the area, if the cathode, uh, area of the cathode is becomes very high, the corrosion condensity on the anode is going to be high. So, that means you can say that if a cathode tends to become infinity, I A is going to tend to become infinity. When I say I A here, I mean the increase in the corrosion rate because of galvanic action. On the other hand, A A tends to become infinity, I A tends to become 0 due to galvanic couple. Understood? So, what does it really mean in practice? If you are an engineer, you want to construct certain component, what should be the design criteria? Yes, you should take care that that the component you are thinking about, you are choosing a material, you have to choose two metals, you have no choice but to do that should always ensure that the anode is larger and the cathode is smaller. The vice versa could be a real problem, ok. And this can be also seen by the mixed potential theory as well, ok. Let us look at the mixed potential theory see whether it is, is correct or not. I am putting log capital I here, I am not using here small i, capital I means what current right ok. And uh, assume that this is steel, steel and um, so it is I am going as Fe 2 plus. 
in acid, right? Mm -hmm. And I have the area ratio of iron and, and, and platinum are equal to 1. I am not showing the cathodic curve corresponding to steel because the hydrogen evolution on steel is lower compared to hydrogen evolution or you can show it here, it is ok. I naught H plus H on, on steel ok. Then you can use platinum. Platinum, right? This is uh, this is area ratio is is let's say is one centimeter square. You know, steel platinum one centimeter square steel. Okay, one centimeter square. I make platinum. It's about thousand centimeter square. When you make a thousand centimeter square, you can please make a, I think it is a small change here. You cannot make this I naught here should be capital I, ok. Because we are talking about the area, we are not talking about the uh, normalized, we are talking about actual current, right. So, if you are going to have uh, multiply the area of that, it is going to be like this, ok. This is thousand times. the area ok. So, the corrosion rate would would increase because of the galvanic action. And this has some practical implications and um, I just repeat the illustration given in Fontana's book. It is not too concentrated, but it is you know it is not it is not reasonably concentrated sulfuric acid. See it very highly concentrated sulfuric acid um, ok, you do not need anything. The steel is it offers very high resistance to corrosion, but moderate concentration and dilute concent, uh, you know um, you know dilute acids the steel corrodes heavily in, in sulfuric acid. So, how do how does the how does the steel um, becomes resistance to corrosion? Uh, you, you you apply a coating. We call it lining actually, right? You you give a epoxy lining. The difference between a lining and a coating is the following. The coating is normally given in order to prevent the corrosion of the metal, but the lining is given not only to prevent the corrosion of metal, but also to see that the product does not contaminate right. So, you know I mean you may allow metal to corrode ok, because you can replace it, but if the sulfuric acid has got too much of iron corrosion products, there is no use. So, the lining is generally meant to uh, you know prevent corrosion to the extent that the corrosion products they do not contaminate whatever process uh, fluid that you are talking about. Now, um, initially a tank was steel tank was was used and they had this was the epoxy lining this is sulfuric acid. It is working well ok. It gave us to few few years of service ok, there is no problem. But what happens you know there is always a mechanical damage you know people want to uh, clean the uh, tank. So, when you start cleaning the tank and the bottom of the tank more often suffered the corrosion ok. Severe 
corrosion. But lasted for a few years. Seven, eight years it lasted. And they found that the corrosion is more often on the bottom, is more due to mechanical damage due to corrosion damage. They thought that they can line this tank with stainless steel. Stainless steel is harder and mechanically it is quite sound and uh, you know you do not have to to worry about mechanical damage. When they want to do a lining of stainless steel, then they thought ok, let them let us not line completely the tank because this costs more. See many of the tanks are very very big right. It, it, you know you can save money by reducing uh, the you know the lining and it is happening anyway only at the bottom of it. So, they started giving a lining. In, in this manner. They gave a lining to this and the top portion the steel and it was a steel the tank and it is coated. It is not really well drawn anyway, it is a paint. This is painted. How do you line it? And this is a place you weld, right? Welded and you can see ok, you can make it a little more neat. This is stainless steel lining. Stainless steel uh, lining is done. Interestingly, this is sulfuric acid. Now, tank failed. Very shortly, and it failed where? Failed. at the weldment. Ok. Now, you see here you spend stainless steel uh, very high expensive lining. Despite that the life is very short. Very interestingly the guy diagnosed saying that the painting is bad and so the tank failed because the painting occur I mean the corrosion occurred at the paint and this place is, is welded here right and you weld it and painting is always difficult at the at the at the, at the painted location right. Normally you grind uh, very nicely and then you paint so the person said that oh the failures happened because of the improper painting of that and they went on to say that you should we should redo the painting. But some wisdom prevailed and tried to look at why it is failed, why it failed. Before I go into that answer, can you anybody guess or find out why it has happened? Hmm? Fantastic, ok. The paint can never be impervious, always porous. 
when the paint is imp not impervious, it is porous. Now, what happens? There are very fine, finite place, small locations you have an anode. Not only that, you have a lining which is stainless steel lining which is a cathode. That cathode is of infinite area compared to very finite anode below the coating defects. So, very highly accelerated corrosion taking place, right. So, the reason is simple. What is the reason? The reason is ok, defective coating Then what happens? You have A C upon A A tend to becomes infinity. Why it failed? So, there are several such cases why coatings uh, you know are to be given only on cathode if you cannot coat both right or you coat completely suppose had the guy has coated completely both the anode and cathode then what happens there are defects in the paint coating the cathode also very small in number right small in area no problem. So, this leads to the understanding that if you have dissimilar metals you coat both the anode and cathode if you cannot coat then what happens we coat only the cathode. So, if you can coat only the cathode then what happens then you will have a very very finite area of the cathode the galvanic corrosion becomes very minimal and you would not have any problem at all. So, coat both anode and cathode or if not possible coat only the cathode and not the anode. So, such kind of surprising you know conclusions that will come out of understanding of the parameters affecting the corrosion ok. So, we have seen now the factors affecting corrosion then I think you should be able to now find out or able to propose how to prevent Or mitigate galvanic corrosion. Yeah, I want a very quick answer. Quickly, you should move forward. Yeah, how do I mitigate galvanic corrosion? Yeah, avoid use of dissimilar metal. That is simply not possible. Hmm? Okay, in many cases you have seen in the case of India exchanger, not possible. If I have to use, then I have to use, I use what the first criteria, what do I see, look for first? I look for anode area, look at it, but I, if I can choose metals, yeah. So, I look at the galvanic series, right, I look at the galvanic series. Okay. Metals closer in the galvanic series. What more I do that? Yeah, I can also look at higher anodic and the ratios, ok. Where is it is possible? You could look for higher anodic to cathodic area ratio. Then what happens? I can isolate electrically, right? I can insulate, insulate electrically. Please look at where possible, you know, it may not be possible everywhere, ok. What else I can do? Coating, right? So, coating. It is an important lesson here, right. 
what is the lesson here? Coat, yeah, board, coat, coat both anode and cathode. If not possible, coat the cathode. So, we also had one more lesson in terms of effect of environment on galvanic corrosion. What is that? More severe is the environment, more severe will be the galvanic attack. So, how do I reduce the corrosivity of the environment? Yeah? Yeah, what is that? Inhibitors, right? Use inhibitors. They are done, huh? In cooling water systems, people add inhibitors. Hmm? What more you can do? Yeah, you can use the third one use the third metal, third metal active to both. Eh? This is used much in industry, yeah? this is done mostly in industries, I just given this figure you have seen before, right. And it is an heat exchanger, this is the this is called a header or, or water wall boxes, header it is. These tubes uh, generally are stainless steels, there is a galvanic corrosion here. How do we control galvanic corrosions? You can in these places, you can use zinc anodes, zinc anodes, zinc anodes, ok. When I weld these places with the zinc anodes, what happens now? The steel though active to stainless steel, it is rendered noble with respect to the zinc. So, zinc corrodes. So, so you, you know a couple of years no problem ok and you can replace the zinc anodes periodically and it is done in industries ok. It is not uncommon, it is done widely practiced in order to reduce the corrosion of corrosion of the uh, the active metals, ok, it's done. So, use a third metal that means you have ok, this is your cathode, so anode, what happened? You are going to use A1 and A1 is, A1 is anodic to A and C is what? C is a cathodic. So, so you can have you can replace this A1 all the time, right? You know, whenever you, you, you find this anode is dissolved. Right? So, it is a sacrificial one, ok. You can also do one thing, um, you can also, you know, seven make this uh, anodic anodic parts. easily replaceable. You can design that, right. You please notice we have given some 7, 8 like this, right, 6, 7. Not necessarily all of them will work, it depends upon the particular application. You might use a combination of one or two or, or one or more. The idea is that the cost being down and there is a reliability a safety in the system ok. So, that is an engineering aspect of um, okay, what kind of technique can be used to avoid the galvanic corrosion of metals. So, we are talking about mitigation, let us go to the last important one that is how do you test.
for galvanic corrosion. So, what are the uh, testing that you would like to do? The most simple test, what will be that? I just give you two metals, I want to know if they are compatible or not or I give you three metals, you find out which is, which are the two are most compatible. I want to do a very quick test, ok. What test will be useful? You, you studied all of them, all parameters and all. Three metals are given to you or I have given you, let us say half a dozen metals are given to you. You do not have much time, I just want to choose two of them. Otherwise, all six of them are all satisfy the requirements like what are our requirements I want to choose. Yeah? Yeah, first of all you can determine the, the galvanic potentials, right? Is I, I call it as E car actually, ok, E car. In a given environment, you just measure it, right. You choose those two metals which lie close in E car values, right. So, E car is one important parameter. But it does not give you the corrosion rates, right. It does not give you corrosion rates. So, you want to determine the corrosion rate in the in the galvanic systems what parameter do you use? Will I car of each of them will work? Will it work? I give you I car of metal A, I car of metal B, will that be useful you think you can use that? Yeah? Would that be useful? Not useful? If useful how it is useful? If it not useful tell why it is not useful. Yeah. Yeah. So, I car by itself is not useful, it cannot give you a direction which of the two will undergo corrosion. First of all, it does not even tell you which of the two will be anodic in nature or cathodic in nature. So, ok, not useful. Ok. I can do a weight loss method, right. I can do a weight loss method. What I can do? I can short both of them, right, and I can determine the corrosion rate, right. I can just short, short both the metals, determine the corrosion rate. This is time consuming, it takes more time, right. What I can do? If I want to use a Faraday's law, ok, and I just give you a clue, right, and I want to find out, you know, what kind of corrosion rate, you know, I just give you half an hour, assume that system is stable, ok. In half an hour times, I want to find out the galvanic corrosion rate, what parameter do you measure? Assuming that the system becomes stable of course, what do you want to measure? I can measure galvanic current or not, I can measure the galvanic current, can I? Can I? Just have metal one, metal two, only only problem here is I should use a zero resistance ammeter, huh? otherwise what will happen? The ammeter itself will uh, offer resistance, the current flow will be reduced, right. So, use a zero resistance ammeter, you can do that. 
okay. So it is a quick method, it may not take as much time as it will happen in the case of uh, weight loss. But these two techniques suffer one problem, what is the problem? The galvanic corrosion rate depends on what? It depends only on two different metals or depends anything, anything more, yeah. Of course, that is taken care of here, right? Anything more that will affect the corrosion rate of, of the active metal? Environment is known that is given to you, you use the environment only. Yeah? Yeah, tell me what is that? Area is going to change, right? If you are going to change the area, then the rate of attack of the anode is going to be different, right? So, there is going to be one more effect which is an area effect. So, which means when you do a test, you have to ask a question, what is the area ratio in the actual field? I need to choose that area ratio, otherwise the corrosion rate so measured will not reflect the corrosion rate of a given metal in a given component, right. So, area effect is a very important one. So, you may have to do several tests to find out what happens to the corrosion rate in the area effect is changed, ok. So, that can be circumvented by a simple technique which is called as the electrochemical technique. You can use Tafel extrapolation. I hope you understood what I am what I am trying to say. How do I how do I determine? I say that I carry out only one test for the anode and one test for the cathode, so called cathode, and I use the data for all variations in the area, right? Can I? I give you only one data for anode, I mean so called anode, both cathodic curve and anodic curve, and I give uh, one anodic curve and one cathodic curve for the noble metal. Now, I say hey, please use it for different area ratios, possible? Not possible. So, I carry out electrochemical experiment, right? I just carry out an electrochemical experiment, scan from one potential to another potentials, I get this, ok. And um, so, this is the data I get current density versus E this, this is the data I give it to you. From this, can you determine? the galvanic corrosion rate if the area ratios are changed. Assume that the cathode is becoming 100 times more ok in terms of area, what happens? So, you would what ok, so what do you do in that case? So, you multiply this by 100 times right? So, you do not plot high uh, small i, you plot current here, log current versus this and so this you multiply by 100 times, moves over here or if the anode is, I mean oh, sorry, oh, ok, this is metal A, metal A in this case is, uh, is this anode here, but if the cathode, I am sorry, you see this is the cathode in this case, right, ok. It is a cathode here, it is the anode here, right. So, you multiply this by 100 times, it moves here. If the anode is uh, is 100 times uh, you know larger in size, then you multiply this current by 100 times and you start moving up here. The same curve can be used to determine the galvanic corrosion rate of metal under different area ratios. All you need to do is you need to get only one, 
polarization curve for the different metals and then you can find out the, the galvanic corrosion rate of the metals ok. So, um, so much easier. So, what I mean is that uh, this is where you understand how the events diagrams or how the electrochemical kinetics will help you in many ways you know ok, even testing also you can make it a very effective testing ok. And do you have any questions? Hmm? So, with this we will complete our uh, discussion on the galvanic corrosion rate of metals. We saw in the beginning that the galvanic corrosion primarily occurs because of the galvanic potential difference between the two, two different metals that are in service. The galvanic corrosion does not depend upon the equilibrium potentials of course. And we also looked at the cases like active metal and noble metal and two different active metals in the passive systems. And we say the electrochemical parameters such as exchange gun density, tafel slopes, the equilibrium potentials or the factors that control the, the galvanic potential, the galvanic corrosion current density ok. The extent of corrosion depends upon the nature of environment like how corrosive it is. So, when the environment is changing its properties, you rise the temperature and all these issues, then there can be change in the galvanic behavior, a one metal can turn into a, uh, the metal which was behaving earlier as a noble metal can turn into active metal. And the other important thing is the, the fingerprint, the signature of the galvanic corrosion is, is very clear. It occurs at the, at the anode cathodic interface and occurs at the anodic side. In fact, it is a groove, it is not even a straight one. It occurs straight one, I mean something like that, then there is something more than that actually, ok. Assume that I have you know metal 1, metal 2, it occurs at the anodic side, but occurs fully as a groove, it is not like a you know it is not like a V groove, then it is not really in my view it is not going to be a truly a, a galvanic corrosion, there may be some segregation of something happening in the interface. So, the fingerprints of galvanic corrosion need to be understood ok. The other important area which you need to, to look at is that if you have a component where you are fabricating the two different metals, the anode area has to be always larger and the cathode area has to be always smaller. And, um, and we have also seen how the, uh, the events diagrams can be used to, to determine the galvanic corrosion rate of metals with a simple experimentation. And uh, with this we will end our discussion on uh, the, uh, the, the uh, galvanic corrosion of uh, metals. The, the next class I think we will go on discussing about the crevice corrosion ok. So, thank you very much.